Hello, what is up, friends? This is Jared Aguilar from the Duck Legs Podcast. I'm a physical therapy student here in Austin, Texas. I have two co-hosts, Dimer Jones and Tyler Adams. They're also PT students. Coming to you live with a fresh episode, we have Dr. Danny Matei on this week's episode. You know him already. You know him from Doc and Jock, and you know him from the his newest podcast venture, the PT Entrepreneur Podcast. And today's episode is all about how to be a doc in a box, how to set up a physical therapy clinic inside of a gym, CrossFit gym, yoga studio, whatever, what have you, how to be a doc in a box. We learned about Doc Danny working with MWOD, we learned about his time being a physical therapist in the army, from starting out moving to Atlanta, not knowing anybody, and how he hustled and going from not knowing anybody to open up opening up a cash PT clinic in a gym uh, all by yourself to now having athletes potential with a standalone location and two satellite locations just crushing it in Atlanta and of course everything he's doing with Doc and Jock and the PT Entrepreneur Podcast we got a great sense of what makes him tick and how he seems to be always on and this one hits close to home for us because, you know, speaking for Dimir, Tyler, and myself, this is the Doc in a Box life. That's something that we are all looking forward to, to, to some extent. That's what we, that's what we're striving for. You know, at least part time, coming out of graduate, coming after uh, we graduate, having a part time set up in a gym as a physical therapist, treating the clients of the gym and and that local area would be fantastic. And I mean, if you're a fan of this podcast, you know uh, how much we think, how much we love the idea of cash PTs and, and being a doc in a box. You know, we've had Gerard Carter and Mitch Babcock. And I think that's that's definitely the vibe that all three of us here on the podcast are attracted to. And that's definitely the cash PT, the gym PT life. That's definitely something we're striving for. But yeah, if this episode resonated with you and you're like, holy shit, I got to go make moves and learn the biz side of this stuff that you're not really getting in PT school and you want to learn how to set up a PT clinic in a gym and learn more about that side of it. Uh, Dr. Danny does have the gym PT blueprint course. I'm currently taking it right now. I'm in module two out of six and I'm loving it. It is a course specifically for PTs that want to create a clinic inside of a gym. It is a badass fucking course. I mean, the modules cover everything from mindset, daily operations of the gym PT, uh, dealing with insurance, finance, sales, marketing. Besides all the straightforward, uh, great info of like, this is how you set up an LLC and this is how you get this in line that you know nobody really teaches you. Uh, some big takeaways for me so far is uh, just just the mindset shift of focusing on helping people figure out a solution, how you can bring value to them, how can you help a person, how can you help your client achieve their goal? You're, you're not trying to convince them that physical therapy is worth the money, but that them achieving their goal or the client fixing their problem is worth the money. Because when it comes down to it, it's all about talking to the client about the problem and figuring out a solution, if you can solve it. You can learn more about this badass course at drdannymatei.com. Or if you are like, yo, I want to check this out right now and sign up, we do have an affiliate link for the Duck Legs podcast. And that link is in the show notes and on our, our Facebook posts as well. You can click that to sign up for the course and we'll get a little uh, kickback and you can take a badass course and also support the duck legs at the same time. So good luck to you. Uh, If you're on a budget, listen to the PT Entrepreneur Podcast because he's dropping gems on the regular. Danny Matei is just coming with it. The the Facebook Lives on his uh, Facebook page, Dr. Danny Mata, they've been amazing. So feel free to check those links out if you like. 
Uh, we're about to get down into the podcast. I've been talking for way too long. Sorry about that. Uh, so, without further ado, enjoy. Peace. Hey, hey, another episode of the Duck Legs Podcast. Super excited about this one. Who do we have on, Tyler? Ooh, Dr. Danny Mata. Dr. Danny Mata. Are we saying that last name right, sir? You know, it's it's uh Uh-oh. it's 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 actually Matei, but don't worry about it, man. Oh, because, you messed it up already. Bro, no, no, listen, man. <laughs> I've got I have like good friends of mine that still pronounce my name that way, and I just don't even I don't even um correct them. Just let it go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matei, right? Matei. Matei, come Matei. on. Already starting off on a bad foot now. But it's all good. If you don't know if anybody out there that's listening to this podcast that doesn't hasn't heard of the Doc and Jock podcast, yeah, Doc and Jock, you need to turn this off right now and go listen to all the episodes of Doc and Jock that you can. It's it's one definitely one of my favorite podcasts, especially um, as a person that just took the CrossFit Level One. Definitely need to dive nice. in more, and I'm I'm trying to get in more into the CrossFit community. But we can talk about that. That's a whole another uh, issue or topic. Uh, sure. But Doctor Danny Matei. From Doc and Jock Podcast, he is the Doc half of the Doc and Jock Podcast. We have uh, Director of Tactical uh, Instruction over at MWOD. Yeah. Owner of Athletes Potential down in Decatur, Georgia. Decatur where it's greater. We got, <laughs> another, we got another Southern boy we got on a, the podcast. Another there. Southern on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I don't think you've even had a formal introduction yet. Sorry, Dr. Danny. Uh, Jared Aguilar here. Tyler Adams. Um, we are coming to you out of Austin, Texas. Diamond Jones coming from you out of Savannah, Georgia. So, yeah. Is uh, it hotter in Austin right now or Savannah? That's the question. Uh, uh, or, or, is, or Decatur. Decatur, Georgia. Which one is it? We don't have to really look that up. But I'm it's, just, it's, it's, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's Atlanta area, so it's got to be hotter in Savannah, man. It's got, I, I can't imagine it. Atlanta's hotter in Savannah. Uh, uh, it is hot and it is humid right now because it is raining. It's been raining for like two weeks straight. It's flooding everywhere. It's ridiculous. Oh, whoa. Yeah, All right. So, so, Dr. Danny, um, again, just in case they don't know, Doc and Jock podcast right there. And you, immediately this is from Doc and Jock podcast, you're going to see how much you're influencing and you're involved with the MWOD stuff like that. Can you just take us through like, you know, just a day in the life of, of what it is to be baller status? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I wish I knew who that was, but uh, you know, so well, I mean, uh, a normal day. I don't know. Today, I'll tell you what I did. So, um, so I had patients this morning from uh, uh, six until nine. So I had a six, seven, and eight o'clock patient, and then I shot up to a uh, a business development meeting in in Buckhead, which is about thirty minutes away, for about two hours. Went and got a new iPhone, and then came back, took care of some work, um, played with my kids, jumped on the trampoline. I just shot them with a hose outside for a little bit, cooked some, uh, some dinner on, on the green egg and then, um, jumped on a podcast, but you know, that's kind of non-clinical day for, for me and it, but normal day, man, I mean, I'm in clinic from like uh, six in the morning until about 3 PM. And then, um, you know, catching up on stuff after that evenings, I do a lot of podcasts, a lot of content creation, and I spend a lot of time around other business owners, man. I think if you own a business, you should spend time around other people that own businesses because it, it just, it helps really, um, push you forward in terms of, of your knowledge base. It's kind of like if you're a physical therapist and you want to become a better physical therapist, well, you find, you know, you find mentors, uh, people that are better than you at that specific task and you learn from them. Right. Excellent. How many patients are you treating when you, a day when you uh, work in the clinic? So a a full day for me would be somewhere between seven and eight. So we do, we do hour long visits. Um, and, and my schedule is a little bit limited compared to our other, um, PT and then soon to be our third, our third PT that's going to start in August. Um, so there's, their like full schedule is really, uh, they have 35 patient hour visits uh, a week. And then ideally we want them 85 to 90% full. So somewhere around 30 visits a week. Uh, and then for me, I try to not see more than maybe like 22 right now. And then dropping that down to probably closer to like 14, 15, as we take on some other, some other business goals. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, just to back up a little bit, um, I just want to talk about your practice overall. So yeah. um, it's cash based. Um, and, and I just want to know why did why did you decide to go that route? Um, was it anything that you seen, and you know, being a part of the military, you just wanted the autonomy, or what was your reason for setting up a hundred percent cash base? If I'm 
not mistaken, uh, practice and no, not, no, it, you know, do some insurance. It's a, yeah, it's a hundred. We don't, we don't mess with that insurance crap. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you, I'll tell you the real reason behind it was um, when I got out of the army, uh, you know, uh, I, the reason I left was because Kelly Sturette had offered me an opportunity to teach for Mobility Watt. So um, we moved to Atlanta because it's got a, it's got a massive airport. It's easy to get in and out of. And I was traveling like, I think 30 weekends that first year I taught. So I was, wow. I was on the road a lot. And so I needed something to do during the week. Otherwise I was going to drive my wife crazy when I was home. So, you know, I, I didn't have any aspirations to grow this like big business to where it is today. All I needed, all I wanted to do is work with people the way that I wanted to work with them and not have to mess with any of the hassle of, you know, messing with insurance or going to talk to doctors about sending me people and hoping they send me a referral. So I just basically, figured out, Hey, this is probably the easiest solution for me. Um, and I didn't really expect to kind of grow it. Um, it just kind of organically happened. A and I also, you know, I kind of said to myself, well, who do I want to work with and where are those people? Well, active people that have, you know, goals in place and are, uh, motivated to change. I mean, that's a CrossFit community in a nutshell. So I opened a, I opened up a practice in a CrossFit gym and, and, um, so yeah, I wish I could tell you I had some sort of like, you know, I don't know, Warren Buffett moment and saw everything for everybody <laughs> else. Did. I didn't really, I mean, I just literally picked what I thought I would enjoy the most. It sounds like your Warren Buffett moment is the realization that you don't want to work with that crap insurance. That's, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. That's probably it. Well, you know, I mean, I really don't know what it's like to take insurance because I've never, I've never practiced. In, I mean, except for as my time as an intern, this was actually with a Texas physical therapy specialist in New Braunfels, Texas. So, you know, when I, when I went to Baylor, our last year was, um, w was with an internship in a, um, an out, outpatient clinic. And there's so many of us in the area that we had, some of us had to go to civilian clinics. So, so I, I worked in an in insurance based model for a year, but I never really, knew what the heck was going on in terms of the insurance stuff. And then in the army, you know, it's a socialized medical model, dude. So we're not, we're not billing insurance. I mean, we, we, we keep track of our time. So when I got out, I mean, I literally know very little about insurance. All I know is what, what we do and what, what people's outer network benefits can be and how that, you know, relates to us and our practice and all the things I actually need to know. But when it comes to like ICD nine codes and what, what I get reimbursed for, if I add this, whatever multiplier on it, I don't know that stuff. As <laughs> I'm going to speak for Tyler a little bit too, as two students currently taking an admin and business course where we have to know G, uh, G codes and Medicare stats for a test. We envy you so much yeah. right now. So yeah. Yeah. Man. yeah. Yeah, man, yeah, great. I don't even know what that stuff means. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't really tell you either. Uh, it just to me, I don't. I don't want to get too much. But like, that's yeah. the epitome of like what I envision. I love. Like, I would love for us to embody this. Like, hey, let's work on getting people out of pain and getting them what they truly want, rather than worrying so much about G codes. Oh man, look, man. This the, the reality is, people will they'll come to see you know providers in that model and. When I did it, let's see, three years ago, I guess, June of uh, 2014, when we started our practice, I mean, it was kind of a, I guess it was kind of like a unheard of, not necessarily unheard of, but there were very few people doing something similar to this. I just happened to have a mentor that had done it in Kelly Sturette, you know, and Kelly, it, and his practice, it, it was in a Connex box in a parking lot. Like, you have to understand, the, the gym that they used to have was literally in a parking lot behind a sporting goods store. Like, all the videos that they have on Mobility Wad where they're in a parking lot, that's the gym. And there's this little Connex box next to it that's, that's just big enough for a table and Kelly's big body to move around the table that, I mean, I, anybody in their right mind would have thought, no way in hell is this going to work. But, you know, he was, he was booked out for weeks and it's because he got people better faster. He taught them things that they could do when they weren't around us and they were more than willing to pay however much money per hour um, and travel a long distance to work with that guy for a few sessions. Wow. I, I actually had no idea that K Star's background was like that. And that's so empowering to hear that. And I feel like that's one thing he did that was so important was he empowered people to go help themselves. Right. So I've got one, I've got one thing I've just been, before I lose it, I just definitely want to ask you about. So when I envision and I feel like a lot of people are like this when I envision going and getting that like, clinic attached to a gym set up for the first time, you know, thinking about going and getting those clients. I think about uh, Dr. Mitch Babcock right now. Are, are you, are you hustling the floor? Are you just hanging out in the gym all day? Are you, do you have your cart at the front desk? What is that like to gain clients over time? And we talked a little bit about it, but like, what are some strategies or what is it like? I like, I, I like how you, you keep, 
wanting to put uh, Dr. Danny in the gym. And he's like, he told you that I, I have a clinic. Not, it's a clinic, not a gym. But, but it's, it's wanna... like connected to a gym. Oh, yeah, totally. No, no, no. That's, so that... how do you go grab oh, those okay. people? Yep. You know, so, so, okay, I'll, let me, I'll explain to you how we did it. I mean, 100%. If you listen to this and you just do what I tell you to, you'll be successful with this practice. The, the problem is, like, 95% of the people that listen to this, they're going to be like, yeah, that's a good idea. And then they'll, they won't do shit about it. Like, they won't implement it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the reality, man, between mm-hmm. people that actually do things and people that don't, right? And so, so here's what I did. So, I taught three nights a week. Three nights a week, I t- taught movement and mobility courses on a- anything under the sun, right? How to improve your squat, how to, how to deadlift without back pain, overhead in, you know, mobility improvement, improving the, uh, the, the like internal rotation for the snatch for the second pull, you know, like I, I t- everything, anything you could think of, foot and ankle mechanics, previous ankle sprain, how to over get over this stuff. So I taught an hour at a time at probably, I don't know, 20 different gyms around the city of Atlanta. <laughs> Um, and I would do that like two to three nights a week. And I mean, I just would get in front of people and talk, man, and, and, and educate. And for me, that was the most, uh, important use of my time because most people with the, here's what'll happen is if they do go down that route and they open up, they open up their office. If you just sit there and you wait for people to come to you, I mean, unless you have some sort of previous relationship with people or some sort of reputation, it's not going to happen. You know, and I, and I moved to a city where I, look, I literally knew no one, zero people. You know, this is a new city for me. And I came out of a situation where I was in the army. So I, I wasn't even around this city. I didn't know any doctors. I didn't know any referral partners. Nobody knew how I was, you know, so what was I going to do? So I got out in front of as many people as I could and I educated and, you know, you teach somebody something and you can help teach them how to help themselves. You gain a lot of trust with people that way. And, and that really just kind of snowballs in, into once you get a few people in your door and you can show them that you can really help them, they go and they tell all their friends and they just can't shut up about it. And it just grows, man. So you, you can do that. Like I've never been the kind of person that was, that was like, Hey bro, your, your deadlift looks bad. Come see me and I'll fix that. You know, like that's kind of douchebaggish in my opinion. Like if you're going to do that, you know, I, I, I always fell in the mentality of, I almost wanted people to feel like I was busier than I was early on. Like that sounds kind of <laughs> odd, but you know, you want what you can't have in many ways. So I would limit my schedule days to only like two days during the week. So I would inherently be like, oh, I can't get you in this week. Uh, I, I'll have to, you have to get you on the wait list for next week. You know, and they have two damn days, you know? So, <laughs> but, but in their side, awesome. In their mind, they were like, damn, this guy's busy. Okay, so I really got to work with this, with this boy. So, and, that's, and that's what happened, man. So um, if, if you're looking at doing that, you know, I think, I think A, you got to make sure you pick the right gym. Like having a, having a gym that has business-minded owners is really important. Pick a good location that is accessible. Some of these CrossFit gyms in particular can be in just random-ass places that are not near anybody where they actually live or work. Um, so you, you can hurt yourself that way. And then also make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot by having some sort of terrible, you know, profit share contract with a gym owner where you think it's cool up front until you start actually making some money and realize you're paying them a ton of rent. Mm. Uh, so many things I want to jump off, um, off of, off of all that yeah. wonderful yeah. speech though. Just said, love the passion. First of all, like I'm getting so hyped right now. Listen to Danny. Um, one quick thing I wanted to touch on was your grassroots effort of just putting yourself out there. And if we can maybe throw in a Gary V, uh, line, it sounds like you focused on definitely leveraging the, the one-on-one mm-hmm. interactions, right? Building those relationships right from the get go. Uh, and that's, there's really nothing. That's almost like you can't teach that. You just got to go out there and do, you got to go out and shake hands and, and not be the douchey salesy. Oh, you should come, uh, let me help you at your squat, your yeah. bro. But <laughs> just be like, I'm here, I'm here for you if you need it. And also my schedule's kind of busy, but I'll fit you in. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, look, there's, there's a time to, there's a time to sell and there's a time to educate and Mm -hmm. nobody wants to be sold to when they don't know who you are. And sales, sales is a bad term anyway. Right. I mean, I feel like people hear that and it's, it's just, it sounds bad, but really it's persuasion in a very positive way. Because if you think about what we're doing is, I mean, we're helping people avoid surgery, getting back to being physically active, you know, staying in shape, doing things with their friends that they really enjoy, the stress component that comes along with that, just decreased stress and, and longevity of their life. Like we're helping them with a lot of really positive things. So 
you know, for, I'm not necessarily, I don't feel bad about trying to uh, sell somebody on the fact that, hey, we need to see you for X amount of visits to solve this problem and have the strongest likelihood that it never comes back. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's totally fine because otherwise I did a bad job. And then what if they end up with some sort of surgery they could have avoided and then long-term pain because of that? You know, that's my fault. That's not their fault. All right. Beautiful. Um, Dimer, you got something? Cause I'm, I'm, I can, I can talk shop all day. So I don't want to, I don't want to hog the mic, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Quick, quick question. Um, you know, from, from myself and then me, Jared and Tyler all talk about this. I am highly interested in, in the model of setting up a cyber CrossFit gym or, you know, some kind of box or whatever you want to call it. Um, and just have my clinic in there. So what are some steps for our listeners to take? Now I know that you mentioned, you know, obviously finding the box, finding the location, making those connections, but yep. what, like all, almost what is the timeline that you uh, would give someone as myself as a, that's going to be a new grad um, or if a new grad should even, you know, consider something like this, you know, go around their own. What is a timeline that you would give? Should it be six months out? Should you, you know, wait a little bit? What's the timeline that you would give? So I think a new grad can do it. I think it, but I think it has to be someone that's really confident in their skill set. Like not everybody, okay. not everybody's going to feel confident as a provider like you, that's something you have to definitely um you know feel good about because you're spending an hour with that person and not only that but they're expecting better outcomes because they're in their mind they're going outside of using their insurance um, which is a whole nother conversation depending on what their actual deductibles are and what they actually owe they don't most people don't even know but but mm -hmm. we look at you know it, the can a new grad do it for sure i think the sweet spot is is like one to two years out I think you have enough clinical experience. Um, you know, you have some time to save some money. Uh, you also have some time to make some um, connections and some relationships. But, uh, you know, look, guys, this is, in, in my opinion, and, you know, I, I mean, this may sound kind of far-fetched, but honestly, there's, in my opinion, I think there's some sort of, like Jim PT revolution that's happening. I see it all over the place. And, and right. if, look, I was, there's 7,400 CrossFit gyms in the U S let's put that in perspective. 7,400. <laughs> Damn. That, that doesn't include country clubs, any other sort of gym facility that is similar, but not branded, you know, under the CrossFit affiliate, any sort right. of one-on-one -on -one personal training, like none of that. That's just, that's just one little sliver of the health and fitness community. So you're talking about, let's just take that, right? What if one out of every seven gyms had a PT in it that was just killing it? Cause he's awesome and people are getting better and they're sending all their friends and families away. That's a thousand physical therapists. You know, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that we could produce as entrepreneurs within our own business, within our own field and actually grow the economy and not get handouts or have to work with somebody else or take crappy insurance and do all the stuff working with people that you actually like. So I think the opportunity is there, but I also think that you have to look at, A, do you have the skill set? B, do you have your business organized? Like, do you understand what your uh, licenses should be? Do you have your license in that? state? Do you have a business license? Do you have an LLC to protect yourself? You know, have you talked to a lawyer to see what your practice act is? Cause you can't just shoot from the hip with that. That shit's the law, you know? So <laughs> right. it, it is what it, I mean, there's definitely some upfront stuff. So I would tell you if you're a confident student and you think you can go out and you have a good relationship and, and it's, and it's some, maybe somebody that you've been working with anyway, as a coach, maybe you've been coaching at a gym or you've been a trainer in the past and maybe you have a couple clients still, I think it's a natural fit and you could probably get started early. If not take that time that year, learn from somebody really good, spend some time getting better at your skill set, and, um, and then, and then dive into it head first, man, because it doesn't take that long. I mean, I, we went from, you know, not to just throw numbers, but like zero, zero patients month one, right? So that was in uh, June of 2014 start out. And not only that, I was gone for half that month. Uh, and I was gone for half the month of August cause I was in Australia teaching for mobility watch. So I was gone for like a ton of time for the early part of our, of our business. And we still went from $0 in revenue, opened the business in June to by November, we were hitting, you know, $12,000 a month in revenue. Wow. Hell yeah. Oh, Hell yeah. Just quick. a quick follow up. Quick, quick, quick follow up. Um, sorry, Jared. You're good. Uh, would, uh, would uh, you say some, for someone like a new grad that maybe not had that skill set or may not have, you know, experienced that, which, you know, that's give or take, you know, rather you should hop in there anyways and not have that skill set. But should, uh, should uh, they find a mentor that's working in that field or should they just get, you know, see as many patients as they can in an outpatient setting? Yeah, I think, I think there's something to be said for getting your reps in, right? So, mm -hmm. um, 
get your reps in, go somewhere where you can uh, work and not have the uh, crazy non-compete. So be careful with these because, mm. you know, sometimes your, your employer, which we don't make people do this. If you don't want to work with us, then you can leave. It doesn't matter. You know, like that's, I think it's a shitty thing to make somebody sign. So mm. a, non, a non-compete, I mean, they may have a 20 mile non-compete for five years and then dude, you gotta, you gotta either wait it out or you gotta go outside of it or move or whatever. So be careful. You don't do that. Um, but get your reps in. And then on the side, I mean, you can, you can absolutely start facilitating some of these things or even, even right. better. I mean, I think a really good way of going about it is, you know, if you want to just, <clears throat> that's all you want to do. You want to be in that gym PT model, which, uh, which I think is great. Uh, you know, you could, you could go at the route of doing kind of PRN work on the side, making mm-hmm. better money per hour, you know, setting yourself up. And during the week, take care of all the business stuff and get yourself going that way without having to just dive all in and have zero dollars coming in, which is very scary. Yes. I know we've talked to a couple of people, um, you know, that there's so many ways to skin the cat, right? Some people do uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, home health or Tuesdays, Thursdays in a a more of a corporate setting outpatient. And then, you know, there's so many ways that, that you can do it. It's just how does it fit your schedule? How does it work for you? I guess. Um, also, uh, to bring it back, you mentioned LLC. I know Tyler and I were always joking about our lack of knowledge and whether, you know, LLC, PLC, like what does all this mean? Is there, is, is the LLC the one that you would recommend for this uh, gym physio setup? Yeah, I, well, I think the, well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, right? So, Wait, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, disclaimer. Yeah. Let's throw that, let's throw that out there. So, so no, I'm not, but you know, we, when we started out, um, we had, yeah, we, we, uh, set up an LLC. I think it's one of the easier things to do. It gives you some, some extra protection, uh, which you definitely want because I mean, th- this is a business, even though it's just you at the time, you know, it, it definitely is a business and, and, uh, establishing an LLC is a way for you to have some um, barriers in terms of, you know, litigation or personally at least. And it also allows you to start structuring things from a tax standpoint, which taxes are a real thing, guys. Like when I got out of the army, uh, most of my income wasn't taxed, right? Like, like it's, it's a lot of what you make in the army is not taxed. And when I got out and I got slapped with our first federal tax bill, I was shocked at how much it was. So, you know, I mean, like you definitely want to make sure that you set yourself up correctly. And, you know, if you have a good small business lawyer and a CPA that you can, uh, you can talk to, I mean, it would be a good use of your money, but I mean, you could also bootstrap it and just go straight into just form an LLC on a rocket lawyer or whatever, something like that. And, um, and, and just, you know, get yourself covered. But, um, there's definitely some, some things that you want to do upfront like that and make sure you have some informed consent um, and have your policies in place. Like that's really helpful from your patients. Beautiful. And uh, practice act. Do we really have to follow that? No, I'm sorry. It's not, it's not a joke. That's a joke. Um, I do. Sound like me over here. <laughs> All right. I was trying to, I'm trying to lead you in that direction, Tyler, because I'm about yeah. to bring it up. I'm about to bring up Tyler's favorite topic, direct access in Texas. So. Oh no, it's terrible. In Georgia. Yeah. Tattoo? <laughs> No, no, Georgia's pretty good actually, but but Texas is Texas uh, is is yeah lagging for sure. Oh yeah, probably yeah. the most restricted uh, of all. So, would you still recommend the gym physio setup uh, in a state with such a restrictive access as Texas? What would sure. you change if if you were trying to set up shop down in uh, hmm. dirty <laughs> of the dirtiest South yeah. state? No, no, I, I, it, well, people are already doing it. I mean, you know, like it's it's the it's it's not independent of a state or a practice act. That's the great part about it, right? Is like, maybe there's a couple more hoops to jump through and it makes it a little more challenging. But then again, maybe there's also some ways around it that are, that are, you know, maybe there's some gray area that um, either, if you can be kind of smart about how you go about this stuff, where in Texas, you know, you have to have that referral. So, you know, you could, you could definitely, you know, see somebody without treating them and just give them an idea of like what you would do. And maybe you can have some sort of like relationship you could develop with a, a doc, especially if it's some sort of younger, more like active doc at the gym already. These have been like helpful for us in terms of, you know, these have been turned into referral partners for us in some ways um, in terms of younger physicians. But for for you guys, I mean, if that's a state that you're going to be in, you know, I would tell you, see somebody, tell them, hey, this is, this is why you have to do it. You know, you could go wherever it is that you need to go. Just, you know, get the referral, come back and we can see as much as we want. I mean, it's it's that simple, but it's just one of those things that you kind of have to factor into the cost of doing business. Gotcha. Another hoop. Another hoop. All right. So oftentimes, you know, you'll hear people talk about, um, 
you, you hear people talking about, oh, I want to open my own clinic and everything like that. And then you hear a lot of people say, hey, pump the brakes right there. You know, have you ever thought about online stuff? Which is really, that, that's really the way to go. And I'm not saying that's wrong, I think. But here's somebody who definitely has had, you've had the four walls before and things like that. And, and you talked about getting screwed over with rent and stuff like that. What, just a general idea of, oh, I'm about to open up my own thing. Should I go straight K-Star with it and go parking lot? Or should, <laughs> should I go 50, you know, 5,000 square feet? Or, and what, what, just kind of what are the, some general rules that come immediately to your head of, of size and, and what you need and what you're looking for? So I'm a big fan of just a lean model, right? So I, if you look at our satellite clinic, uh, initially that we had. And, and now, so basically what happened was we went from one, one clinic um, in, a, in a CrossFit gym to a standalone space that's about 1,800 square feet where we have a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, within in terms of like a recovery center and we have, um, you know, multiple PTs that can work out of that. And now we have a, 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 another satellite clinic. So um, the two satellite clinics that we have are within gyms. Mo both of those spaces are probably like um, maybe – 12 by 15, like it's a decent sized room, but you could definitely have a smaller one. And, um, it, you know, so the, the overhead is really, really low there because there's access to different parts of the city. Um, and it gives us a, uh, you know, a patient population that's around and they see our, they see our, you know, branding as well, which is huge. It's, I tell people, you know, all the time, it's like having a Chick-fil-A in a mall. Like, yeah. have you ever mm. seen a Chick-fil-A in a mall? that's not as busy. <laughs> of course you get <laughs> because it's your target audience right there. So, um, you know, I, I don't think unless you're, I mean, unless you have some sort of like business partner that's backing it and you got some sort of background in, in, um, you know, in business itself, going straight into like a big facility, there's a lot of, um, there, there's definitely a lot of risk with that. And you also have to look at So there's a difference between gross revenue and net revenue. Okay. So gross revenue is how much money you, you, um, you know, accumulate uh, before any uh, overhead is paid, me meaning salaries or rent or supplies or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, kind of uh, supplemental services that you have that are like scheduling or whatever else, right? So, um, a, a good business, a, a traditional business, like if, if, if they're within, let's say, 30% profit margins, they're crushing it, all right? So, 30% uh, net profit. If they have that after all the said and done and they've paid everything out, that's a really, really good business. Most of them will be happy to be around 10%. In a gym PT model, you know, when we're just running that, we were around 85 to 90% uh, net revenue. That means our overhead was really, really low. So, you know, if you take somebody and I mean, these are real numbers, guys, this isn't made up at all. I mean, like this is what we did. We, I mean, before we decided to leverage this into other facilities, you know, it, it, just do the math on this. Okay. So, we say we, we had uh, probably, you know, before we brought anybody else on, you know, I would have 120 to 130 patient visits at $175 a piece. And that was our, that was our month. And our overhead was minimal and the, the net revenue is 90, 85, 90%. So, you know, what, what you can keep is different than what you can make. And so if you look at the model, I know plenty of businesses that, you know, they're, they're, upwards close to seven figure businesses. Let's say they make you know, a million dollars, but they're, they're netting only a hundred thousand dollars because they're a 10% net profit margin. Well, you know, if you have, if you can generate $200,000 in your clinic and you have 90% net profit margins, you literally make more money than that big business does. You keep more of that money, which is really what matters, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you got to keep that in mind. So I'm a big fan of going smaller and being able to then leapfrog that into something else because along the way you can build relationships, you can decide what you really want to do. And the whole way you're not taking on any loans, you know, uh, hopefully no, no debt whatsoever. Um, and then you can springboard into something else, something big, bigger. And, and I really, I think there's three stages, right? So you got, if you want to go this route and this gym PT route, it's let's start uh, in, in a gym. It doesn't have to be across the gym. It should be any kind of gym that you want. Any, anyone you think you have a good relationship with, but, but small space, you leave and then you close your door and you have to worry about anything. You have to worry about somebody cleaning the place, the, you know, the lights being off, whatever. It's just, it's, it's so easy. Now from there, once you grow, you have a decision to make. It's, do I, do I want to have a lifestyle business? Just, I just want to do this four days a week, you know, and make however much, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars, just seeing people that I like four days a week and just keep it like that. And just do that for as long as you want. You could do that. Stage two would be, now I'm looking to grow to either a second facility or I'm going to try to get a standalone facility that now I can start to actually create more passive revenue, not necessarily me seeing people and, and, and start to hire people, which is scary. 
a scary step, but a very important step for you to actually go into owning a business, not necessarily just working in your business, which I don't, people, people will just talk down on that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If you really like what you do, mm -hmm. great, go for it. Now, let's say you get to stage two and you've got, let's say two facilities, you're starting to bring people on, you bring on that first provider. And now all of a sudden, Hey, they're seeing people, you're on vacation and you're still making money, which is a pretty cool thing. You know, now stage three is where you pull yourself out of the business. You start to whittle your schedule down. You start to bring on people to actually see the patient schedule for you. And then you're in charge of marketing that, you know, developing relationships in the area to build your practice and then, and then sales and training of your staff and you're the business owner. So that's the third stage and it depends what you want to do, but all of it really starts with that same place of the gym PT, low overhead, test it out. If you fail, you fail fast and you don't ruin yourself. You don't beg up yourself long term and you just, you can go back to doing whatever you want. It all starts with being a douchebag to that guy with the bad form and the deadlift. Like, <laughs> hey, look, man, there's, there's plenty of people with bad form and their deadlift. <laughs> And, and they will come see you eventually, you know, and, and I mean, it just depends how you get your message out there, man. I mean, you also have to look at, look, we make decisions based on long-term relationships, right? Like we would never, ever tell somebody that they need something that they don't. And, yeah. and, and, you know, our, our community a hundred percent gets that. So they trust us with so much. I mean, if the littlest thing, I'll have somebody and they're like, Ooh, I kind of tweak my ankle a little bit playing tennis. Most people will just walk it off. These people will come in and see us for that because they know we'll just say, Oh, it's not so bad. All right, do this, this, and this, we we'll see it one time and you're out of here. You know, if they have right. 20 year history of lower back pain, it's a totally different conversation. It's like, Hey man, we're probably going to see you a dozen times through this over three months. Cause there's a lot of other things to work on. So, you know, it's, you treat people right and they will come back, they'll tell their friends and your business will grow. Did you, um, especially off the get go, have any sort of refer and receive program? I uh, had, I had nothing. So, and, um, I've had people approach me about that and I don't really like it. I mean, here's, you can, you can do that, but then you also put yourself into, uh, kind of weird territory in terms of, am I really doing this for the best of the, you know, reason for the patient or am I doing this because I kind of feel like I owe this guy, you know, I send people to the best people I can find in the city best personal trainers, best sports med docs, best ortho surgeons. I got a sports med doc that I've probably sent $30,000 worth of business to. And I've never seen one guy, one person from this guy. And I don't mm -hmm. care because I know if I send somebody his way, uh, he's going to, he's going to do the right thing. He's really good at what he does. And my patients are going to be happy because if I make, if I make a bad referral, so you get, you get a hundred percent of the blame for a bad referral and 50% of the credit for a good one. Right? So <laughs> it, 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 if I send somebody to the wrong person, you know, it's on me and I, my reputation is not worth, you know, an extra person from whoever it is. It's, you know, it's, it's not worth it. Beautiful. Uh, and then real quick to go back to uh, the rent deals. Uh, this is still a, uh, an issue that's kind of blurry for me. When you're going to talk to that business owner at, at a CrossFit gym or a different box, what, what mindset should you have with that negotiation conversation? Are you looking for or a percentage based off of the, off of the uh, session per hour, or is it, I have to give me the lowest rent possible and we'll just worry about that. What are you, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, so I think percentages are a bad idea. And the reason why mm -hmm. you don't want, you don't want another business owner, especially another business owner where you're, you're basically working out of their facility to be counting your money. Right. So, um, and the reason I say that is the first facility we had, you know, I, I remember going to lunch with the guy that owned the gym and he was just kind of like, I mean, he, he was basically just telling me his business problems. Just like, Oh man, we got all this overhead and you know, we're only clearing this much or whatever. And I'm sitting there eating my taco, just thinking, God, I hope he doesn't ask me what we're doing because it's, you know, <laughs> we're, I mean, we were like four or five times more than what he was, what he was bringing home. And, Jeez. and we we're paying 400 bucks a month in rent, you know? So I don't want, um, I, I don't think percentages are a good idea. Uh, just because you have to look at it in terms of people, people that would want to do a percentage, they're skittish and they're not sure if, if they're going to be able to, um, you know, generate revenue. And if you go and do it with the mindset of that, you might as well just not do it. And if you go into the mindset of, man, I'm going to be making a lot of money pretty soon. I want to get, I want to get a sublease that's actually like consistent and it's fairly low. Um, that that's a better way to go. I think you have a couple options. Um, I definitely think that just a flat rate is the best thing. You can also look at, you know, maybe you only want to be there a couple days a week and you say, okay, well, I only want to be here a couple days a week. Like what is, you know, what's that going to cost versus, you know, have full access to it. Um, it, there's options. I would also make sure just for your own benefit, see if you can 
basically build in something about not having competing services in the same space. Um, you know, you definitely don't want somebody else opening up shop the same place that you are. And if you don't have it in writing, it's, it's not, I mean, they can do whatever they want. Damn. That's very good to know. Very good to know. Whew. Okay. I've got, I've got, this is a little off topic, but not too far. So all those people that are first now starting off and you are kind of associated with the gym, maybe you work for them, things like that with today's like media, right? You got your Instagram, you got your Snapchat. Yeah. What is, what is, what is the, what's the relationship <laughs> going on there? Do you just say, are you, you know, I feel like sometimes a, a person might be self promoting themselves too much when they are all of a sudden just setting up a full media station right there to show your squat demo. Should, should those people that are out there like, Oh, should I ever score? the squat demo in, in this Gold's gym board? Should you just go ahead and just do it and just to get it out there? Or should you go talk to the person and say, hey, um, what are your thoughts on that? Are you talking about recording somebody you don't know? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about recording yourself in, in oh, a gym okay. that you know the people maybe, or maybe you don't know them, or, or just recording yeah. in, in a gym that you don't own, right? It's not yours. And, you know, <laughs> when does mm-hmm. it become too far? Mm. I, I won't say one person, but there's a, there's a famous person, a very famous person that all of us know. And every time I look at his Instagram, he's in golds. And I'm just like, and he's got someone filming him. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, this guy's getting 10,000 likes off of a golds video. And I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Just going at, do you, do you approach the, the manager and say, hey, I'm going to record. Is that okay? Or should you say, forget it. Just go do it, man. Yeah. You know, I've never <laughs> recorded a video in a goals gym before. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever actually been to goals gym, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, yes. shout, shout, out, like that. shout out to goals gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out. They're a sponsor of our podcast. Danny. Come, Come on, on Danny. Danny. <laughs> oh yeah. No offense. I'm sure that's a, that's a nice spot, but the, you know, the thing is, uh, <laughs> I've never, not. I've never, uh, yeah, it probably sucks, but I've never, um, <laughs> <laughs> Never done that, man. I mean, like we've recorded in the gyms that we have uh, uh, relationships with, where we have offices at our at our own facility. And then, I mean, I've recorded a ton for Mobility Wad and all kinds of other gyms. I would think if that was that gym and it's getting that many likes, like they don't care because they're just getting a bunch of publicity for free. Um, you know, so and, and social media is a whole other animal, right? Like you got to you got to ask yourself. You guys kind of brought up the online stuff, right? So like the brick and mortar versus online. I mean, there's there's a lot of pros and cons for both. And I think that what you have to really think about is, uh, or, or really take into account is what, what do you want to do long-term and it, are there opportunities from a digital space for physical therapists? Absolutely. I mean, you're, uh, so I have, I have a brick and mortar business. I have another podcast, you know, doc and jock, we get advertising dollars for that. Like it's, it's, it's a business. We I'm starting another podcast, which is going to come out in August, which is all about business related topics. You know, I've got, um, digital products through mobility. Wild. we've got digital products through doc and jock. Um, you know, and, and we do, we do remote, uh, consulting occasionally. Um, but you, you could definitely do that a lot more, but guys, you go to school for seven years to learn how to put your hands on people yes. and, and not in a creepy way, but actually help them. <laughs> you know, so like, mm-hmm. I I think if you're going to do some of that, that stuff, social media is a good way to go about it. But you know, also if, if you went to school for that long, just to get the initials and, and not utilize it. I mean, I feel like that's a big waste of money. Dr. Danny, we got like 10 minutes left. If that's okay with you. Yeah, man, you guys got, yeah, man, for sure. We got, 15 minutes, whatever. Uh, I, I got, I got nothing to do besides. Uh, well, I already watched Game of Thrones last Ooh. night, so I'm good to go. <laughs> Final season. Awesome. Oh yeah, I haven't. So I, I haven't been keeping up with Game of Thrones. I know winter was coming, so winter came, right? Is Jon Snow? <laughs> I feel like it's always coming. I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm not gonna spoil it all for everybody. Maybe somebody's listening to this is Game of Thrones. <laughs> Can't sit up on Game of Thrones. Just uh, binge watch it. <laughs> no, I can't listen to the rest of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody was just coming to listen to my cash BT and they end up getting all the Game of Thrones spoilers. <laughs> all right, Dimir, we haven't heard from you in a while, buddy. What's up? Okay, quick quick question. Um, totally off topic of what we're talking about. How happy were you that Army finally beat Navy? Um, you know what, man? I was pretty happy because that it's been a long time since that happened, you know, and yeah. uh, it's Navy just has a better football team. I don't, you know, whatever they do a better job with the, you know, w- with their, their recruiting. I don't know what it is, man. They definitely win a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, my dad, he's, he's in the army, been in for 28 
years now. And I'm telling you, whenever they actually won, he was celebrating. I mean, we're, he's not a huge college football guy. I am. And I was like, dude, calm down. <laughs> yeah. Calm well, down, man. But yeah, it's, but it's been a while. It has been a while. So I just want to ask. Yeah, yeah no, it was, it was, it was great. We didn't win at all while I was in. Actually, it had been a lot longer than, than this when I was in. <laughs> Seven years I was in and nothing. Right. No, not, not at all. And then they, they won their bowl game and everything. But, hey, good year for Army. Hopefully they'll follow it up. I hope so. Yes, sir. All right. So, uh, so getting back to the topic of cash, you know, cash VT and uh, open up your own gym and, and all that. Do, a, do, a you, do a you believe – well, let me ask this. How big can this get? And is too much um, – is it – too much focus on the cash or not cash race, but open up the boxes in the, you know, the clinics inside the gym is, is it too big or is it not enough? All right. How big, how big do you think you can get if you open a, a practice in a gym? Is that what you're asking? Well, no, no, no. Uh, just, you, you know, is a, uh, is a, uh, this such a niche market that I know that you mentioned like a thousand therapists doing it and do uh, you believe that it should be kept at a thousand or do uh, you foresee that this being you know, one of those things that like a viable career option for like tens of thousands of therapists. Like, you know, one day we'll, we'll look in every CrossFit gym actually has like a PT there as if it's like a college football like yeah. team. Man, I right. totally think, I totally think that's viable. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the thing is there are a lot of people in the world, right? So, yeah. uh, and, and damn near every one of them is in pain. So let's, I'll put this in perspective. So when, when we were teaching the, uh, the CrossFit, um, mobility seminar for, for, uh, for, um, Kelly, uh, back when we used to actually teach for CrossFit, when we would go to gyms and, um, we would always ask the same question. We'd say, Hey, raise your hand right now. If you're 100% pain free, right. And nobody would raise their hand. It'd be like maybe five to 10% of people in the thousands of people that I've asked the same question to that actually raise their hand. So technically every single one of those people should go see a, a physical therapist in my opinion. And they mm -hmm. should get, they should get that whatever is going on fixed, or at least, you know, get a better idea of what's going on and get, and get a roadmap for it. So I, there, there's, there's what's, you know, there's what's called an abundance mentality and a scarcity mentality. So a yes, scarcity yes. mentality is basically, mm -hmm. you know, you think, Oh, uh, this person around the corner, like they don't want to steal my business, you know, whatever. And they're 10 miles away. And you know, like in Atlanta, there's 6 million people. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of people here for us to work with. It's just, we, we, we just can't actually work with everybody. I mean, there's just not enough, hours in the day. There's not enough uh, PTs that we could hire, you know, and it's just a matter of, can we get that message in front of people? So if we can do that, and then now you're talking about an abundance of people. And so now we can niche down. So like there's a practice that's cash based. That's like two miles or not even that probably a mile down the road for me. And, you know, her and I are actually you know, pretty, have become pretty good friends because they do a lot of um, pelvic health work yeah. and they do a lot mm -hmm. of um, like, like core stabilization, Pilates, and so we don't really mess with any of that. And we have some people that are more appropriate to work with them. And they have some people that are more appropriate to work with us and maybe have some higher end physical goals. And it's great. So, cause we get those people to the best option. Um, so no, man, I think, I think, I think it's honestly a thousand people, a thousand people new, I'm talking new practices. So if you're listening to this and you're like, man, thousand new practices. Yes. A thousand new practices. There's <laughs> 7,400 CrossFit gyms in the U S and that's just, uh, that's a small percentage of the health and fitness community, you know, and not, not to say that you can't just open a practice, you know, in an office space and have a small space that has low overhead. You could do that too. Um, in my opinion, I just think the gym is an easy way to go. So a thousand people, you know, in the next, in my opinion, the next three to five years, a thousand practices open up. I mean, that would be amazing. Well, Beautiful. you got three guys right here that's going to do it. So, <laughs> yeah, lay it out. Call yeah. the shot, baby. Babe Ruth. Right. Um, so, speaking of abundance mentality, right? I mean, I feel like, you know, your work with MWAD, I, I think that's a two part question. So, the first part being, wow, you know, I feel some of that stuff, Jared and I, we have a little bit of that material. And some of that stuff that you and K Star put out is, uh, no slouch right there. You kind of know what you have to know what you're talking about when you're learning that material. And, and could you speak a little bit on what's that like to educate the, the population with the MWOD stuff? Being on the most progressive front. Of yeah. Physiotherapy. Yeah. Just uh, abundance, giving information, physiotherapy, everyone out there. And then a little bit about what it was like to be um, on the growth of that whole product and everything. I mean, boy, has that just really taken it to the next level. I mean, I, I feel like there is nothing higher than, than what that is in terms of physiotherapy, mobility, and all, and all that stuff. 
Yeah. So uh, I would say, um, you know, number one, the mindset that we take with mobility wad is <clears throat> we, we try to, um, be right on the edge of, are we doing, are we almost like crossing a, you know, a, over a line here is it, cause there's a lot of gray area Yeah. And, and what we feel like what coaches should know and what physios and PTs or whatever, you, you know, practitioner name you want to call it should, should know. Um, there's a lot of overlap and that we should both know that gray area really well. And when we looked at putting this 102 course together, the advanced one that's, that we're teaching now, you know, that's a, pretty hard test, man. Like we have like a 50% pass rate for people that are not, not physios. We have, we have physios that fail the test. And I mean, we get into, we get into a lot of difficult things on purpose. I mean, the goal is we expect a lot out of people by that point. And it's, it, it's teaching people how to have a framework to, to assess movement and correct it that they just didn't learn in school. And that it just, it works so well in terms of a um, leading indicator kind of approach where we're looking at people before there's a problem, but it also works well for to help us diagnostically figure out, Hey, where are you missing some, um, s- some potential movement? Um, and how do we correct that and, and change the movement at the same time to have a long-term uh, effect. So, uh, to yeah. answer your question, I think what we do is we basically look at, you know, where, what can we almost get in trouble for teaching? And, and then we, we basically, we go there, uh, you know, that's and, awesome. And that's it. That's I mean, awesome. Yeah. Well, I, dude, I t- here's the thing, man, when I was in the army and like, look, maybe this isn't what you're supposed to do, but, um, th- we, I mean, I've taught dry needling to medics before, you know, and these are just, these are people that are, well, these are, these are special forces medics. These aren't your average medics. Yeah. So like, you know, like it, it's, it's, it, it, it is what it is, man. You, you can teach people to leverage them as much as you want. And we look at this 102 model as almost we're, we're creating medics out of um, coaches and practitioners that are getting this baseline musculoskeletal, we call it like musculoskeletal trauma approach. What do you yes. do? Where do they need to go? And then from there, be, for them to understand, is this in my lane? No. Okay. Who should I send them to? And vice versa. And, and cause it may not be appropriate for PT. Maybe it's just a smart coach that needs to get their hands on them. And maybe the coach needs to send them to a physio and we teach people, you know, when that's appropriate and when it's not. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. And, and I'm almost done. I have the, uh, the mobility, I'm uh, moving to mobility 101 course. I'm online. I'm almost done going through all the content on there. And you go through that, you go through the videos of Kelly breaking it down. And it is almost like the, the lines are blurred between strength coach, CrossFit coach and physio, right? And like where does one begin? Where does one end? And you know, you bring up your time in the army and this is going to be a uh, kind of a, a callback to Charlie Weingroff and you kind of bring back the mentality of we're, we're in a team. Like yeah. the physio isn't better than the strength coach or the physician, you know, and especially in the army, like I can only imagine nobody gives a shit what your title is. You're just trying to get people better <laughs> and yeah. moving. You're trying to win. Right. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And, and it's, it's also your, um, uh, you just don't have enough resources. So, you know, when I was a brigade physical therapist in the army, they basically took one physical therapist and they put them in charge of injury treatment, injury prevention, and human performance optimization for 3,500 soldiers. That's impossible. It's not going to happen. You know, I had my medic evaluating knees and ankles because I spent time training her up and she was 19 years old. You know, she was a year out of high school. She had just got out of uh, medic training and she was smart as could be, man. And it took me, you know, it probably took me a couple months and she was as proficient on a foot and ankle exam as any PT that I knew that was coming out of school. So, you know, it, it's just a matter of, can you leverage those people? Because it's a little different in the army, right? They, like there's, there's no practice act in Afghanistan. Like nobody, <laughs> what, what's going on? <laughs> that's just the reality. It's a different, it's a different, um, a different situation, man. It's, it's, and there's nobody, there's nobody's union or lobbyist group that's going to tell you, you can't have direct access for this. And that's just bullshit because we've had direct access in the military in my, you know, as far as I know from the seventies with no negative implications from that other co- countries have had direct access. So we could, we can just get mad about this all we want, but I mean like that model is proven. So I think people need to start uh, kind of, looking at this from a team approach and stop necessarily trying to have these little turf war battles over what's really important because it doesn't help the patient at all. Yeah. I don't think I don't, not too many people cracking down on dry needling out there in Afghanistan. Um, last no. question for you, Dr. Dave, before we have to let you go. And then, um, I'm, I'm going to still the last question. Sorry about that. Dimir and Tyler. Hey, it's fine. One, one thing that I'm struggling with, cause I, I definitely want to be where Dr. Danny is at. I mean, this, this podcast has been amazing. This, I mean, this, He's, he's who I want to be, right? <laughs> Straight up, he's who I want to be. Thoughts from thoughts on insurance to being in the movement-based model. 
the, the one thing holding me back, I think, or an irrational, an irrational fear that's holding me back is the common theme, right? It's student loans, student debt. Oh, I, I have, you know, I have to make my payments, right? I have this, this blurry thought in my head that's, that's very vague and it's not well defined of, oh, well, you know, I, I probably need to go the safe route, whatever that means, take a traditional job where I have a steady income in some maybe corporate or private practice clinic. And, you know, I, I'm kind of aware that that's an irrational fear as opposed to, you know, going out there, like you're saying, doing the startup uh, gym physio route where you're, you're going to have to save a bunch of money up front because you probably won't be making an, enough. And then for whatever reason, my head just goes to a place where, well, you know, if I'm going to be new, I'm not going to be treating as many patients. And then all of a sudden, I'm not going to be able to make the, the payments on my student loans. And then I'll just die, right? Because that's the next progression. So any thoughts on that for you to wake me up out of this irrational fear, if that is an irrational fear? Well, so I think the term for this is called uh, catastroph- catastrophizing, as I believe is how you say it. So basically, it's where we, um, yeah, we, we, we take like the, the very unlikely worst case scenario, and then we make it worse, right? So uh, you'll, you'll do this to yourself, like your family members will do this to you as well, if you decide that you want to open a practice. I mean, I remember vividly this conversation I had with my dad. So my dad, 25 years in the army, retired, you know, he was in the medical field. Um, and so when I went in the army, I had all intentions of doing a, a full career until Kelly offered me an opportunity to teach for them. And I decided to get out. So, you know, when I, when I got out, I told my dad, you know, he's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, why, why are you leaving this? You're, you got a chance, you know, to get promoted in the next probably year or two to major. <clears throat> you got these opportunities to go get advanced education and whatever, you know, PhD or go to a, a special operations group and compete for a slot or whatever it is that, you know, opportunities that are there. We're a lot. And I told him, I said, well, I'm going to go um, work for this guy in San Francisco that wrote a book called Becoming a Supple Leopard, which is his crazy name, <laughs> right? And, um, and I'm going to go open a uh, physical therapy practice in, um, in a CrossFit gym in Atlanta, and I'm not going to take insurance. And <laughs> you say that out loud. Why you say it like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you say it out loud, it sounds crazy, right? And, I mean, my family probably t- tried to talk me out of doing it for weeks, uh, it, which doesn't help your confidence at all, by the way. <laughs> no. So, so it, it, if you're not confident in yourself, you're going to have a hard time with that because the other people around you are going to, you know, really, they're, it's, they're just scared for you is all it is. They're not necessarily they don't believe in you. So, and here's what I would say, man. I mean, look, you, you, we could say what we want, you know, the student loans and, and, you know, making payments. And that's all real. That's all real stuff. Right. But, God, man, these are these are first world white collar problems. Like, yeah. are you are you serious? Like, let's let's think about this. Like, we we get we get so many opportunities, and to to have the opportunity to be able to establish your own business, if that means you have to work two jobs and work on the weekend, who cares? Mm-hmm. When I was like, oh, man, dude, look, when I was in college, I worked as a personal trainer for the last two years that I was in. I worked every Saturday and every Sunday for two years. I don't want to hear shit about people not wanting to work on the weekend because right. I'll work on the weekend. I wasn't out drinking with my friends. I had to wake up early and go train people. Why? Because I had to make money because I had to pay for school because I had to actually like do things and progress myself. So I think people are essentially, uh, they just hold themselves back because they're scared to work. And if you're willing to work and you're willing to put yourself in a position where you can have some revenue coming in and you can set yourself up and you know, you do it the right way. Long term, you'll look back in three years and your peers are going to wonder how you got to that same place because they're not there. They're still working for somebody else and they're still looking forward to getting off work and you're looking forward to going to work, which is a nice thing to do when you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, you can't wait to see your six o'clock patient because you're so excited to work with that person. You know, they're going to give you everything they got. You know, that's the, the business that I'm talking about. And, and if it means you got to work a little bit on the side to get there um, and you got to kind of do something that scares you, which frankly you should do anyway. And that's it, man. You got to do it. Holy shit. Right. Fired well, up. Well, fired up. I need to go write down some goals. <laughs> I need to, and I need and to go please do let me, And please let me add, Doc Danny, Jared is the hardest working PT student that I know. <laughs> no, Honestly, and that, no. that is the truth. He does the editing for the podcast. He's <laughs> in like every group imaginable. Like, you know how at the bottom it says like, you know, like certain amount of friends are in a group. He's in like every group that I see. So it's like mutual friend <laughs> in a group. He's in that group. And he's like all on top of it. So that irrational fear that he has that he's not going to make it. It's all irrational because he's crazy to think that he's not going to be successful. That's I didn't my, know, that's hey, it's funny, say. man, because your, fr- your friends can see it, right? Like, yeah. 
I, I think, I think it's totally natural though. Right. And, and, uh, for me, the way I got over that was self-education. I mean, I read, I, I have probably read at least a hundred business books, you know, whether it be personal development, finance, marketing, sales, whatever. I mean, I, over a, over a hundred because I didn't go to business school. We didn't have uh, an elective for business. It, it, I mean, I went to school at Baylor. It's in the army. Why would they teach me business. Like there's no reason whatsoever that they would ever have that in the curriculum. And nobody in the army knew anything about it. Nobody taught me any of that stuff. So what do you got to do, man? You got to educate yourself through podcasts, through simple things like reading books and taking courses. It blows my mind that like a lot of these PTs that are new out of school, you know, they don't think twice about dropping, you know, $1,200 to go to a dry needling course, but man, they'll balk it at like a $500 course on teaching them how to market. Like, are you yeah. kidding? Your, dude, your return on investment is a lot higher if you know how to engage with people and get them to come and see you than if you know how to stick a needle into the, you know, soleus or whatever. <laughs> well, Honestly. You want to hit them? So, let's, Dimir, let's, let's toss up the duck question to him and then wrap things up here, right here. All right. So, the favorite question uh, of the, the podcast is, um, you know, the podcast is called Duck Legs Podcast. So we want to know what is your favorite duck? You know, we've had some animation duck, we have some real ducks, and we have some duck carvings. So what's your favorite <sighs> duck? Man, my favorite, well, DuckTales is my favorite show. No, I, I, I know what it is. It's, it's yeah. Scrooge McDuck, man. It was my, that's a, Scrooge McDuck is a G, DuckTales, uh, growing up. And, uh, you know, they're, they're remaking it uh, fall of 2017. The only reason I know this, I'm not like that deep into DuckTales, but I've got, <laughs> I've got, a, uh, I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and they're, yes. they're pretty excited about this. So um, that show is badass, dude. If you didn't like that show, I don't know if you guys are old enough to even know what I'm talking about. But, uh, I remember it. Yeah, I remember, I remember it. Does. Yep. Scrooge McDuck. I, I remember it was the best, you know, swimming in a, in a, uh, a, a vault of money. Yeah, yeah the <laughs> vault of gold. How is yeah. that not, how's that not everybody's favorite duck? I don't get it. <laughs> yep, Game no of idea. Thrones and DuckTales. Yes. That's what we're talking yes, about. Yes, sir. Danny, that's, how, that's it. <laughs> how can people reach you? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy, man. I mean, like on um, Instagram, at Danny Matei PT, uh, Twitter's the same thing. Um, I'm down to talk. Don't try to argue with me on Twitter. I don't, I don't mess around with that. I got enough shit to deal with. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, if you got a question about this stuff, you know, shoot me an email. I'm going to give you my direct email. It's, it's, this isn't, this is my email. It's Danny at athletespotential.com. You got a question, you know, shoot me an email, take a look, take a listen to Doc and Jock podcast. I mean, from a clinical standpoint, like we try to get people on there, they'll hopefully help you, you know, learn something and become a better provider and a better kind of hybrid, um, you know, uh, physio coach kind of approach. And then, in August, I've got a new podcast coming out that's going to be the PT Entrepreneur Podcast, which, which in my opinion, it's, we, we, have, we have a couple options. You know, we can either um, go the route of working for these big conglomerates that are all basically just getting bought by private equity groups, and you can work for these big groups that you just don't like and you don't enjoy your career that you spent so long trying to, um, try, trying to get to the point where you graduated and then you could work. Or you can say, you know what, man, I, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to, I want to add to uh, the economy, not necessarily just, you know, hope that somebody gives me a handout and, uh, and learn from my experiences, learn from other business owners like myself that are PTs and, and, and not just that, but learn from other P people that are not physical therapists that are killing it in other ways that are, that are hundred percent applicable to us that, that we can really learn a lot of valuable lessons from it. And I hope that if you're interested in this stuff, um, you know, you take a listen to that, that podcast, I think that, uh, you, you, you'll like it. I, I'm just, I, this isn't me just on an average day all riled up. I'm always like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fire it up. Dude. <laughs> This has been amazing. Yeah. No. Thank you so much, Doc Danny, for coming on here and kicking all of our asses. Yeah. Get to work, son. Get, Get to work. work. It's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry that you're afraid of, of not working hard, Jared. <laughs> oh, so, so sorry that you're afraid of putting in work and realizing that, oh, yeah, it's probably going to take some effort to, to live the life that you want to live. I just, he laid down the law so bad on me that I, while he was yelling at me, I just realized how much privilege I have, and then I just hated myself <laughs> for the rest. Calm down, turn, turn it positive. Yeah, switch it around. There, uh, oh yeah, Come it's all now. positive. Thank all you, sir. Positive. Thank you, Doctor. Totally, man. No, yeah, you guys, you guys are welcome. This was great. I mean, I, I love to see that. Uh, you know, there's, there's students and there's younger PTs that are, that are doing things like this because you know this, this reaches a lot more people than you might think, man. And and um, it, it, early on, I know you guys are, you know, haven't been doing this for that long, but I mean, I remember we, Joe and I started our podcast early on. We're like, damn, we got like 
our moms are listening. This is awesome. Like we got a couple people, you know, and then all of a sudden it's, it's like, dang, who, who in Estonia is listening to us? <laughs> who, do we, who do we know in Singapore? Like, it's, it's crazy. It's a huge reach and you guys are affecting people. So, um, you know, keep, keep up the good work. I know it can be a little stressful with school, but um, it's a great, great way to kind of get yourself out there, build a personal brand and educate other people. There you go. Leveraging relationships. Let's make it happen. Pre- Thank you, sir. It. Thank you again, Dr. Danny. You got it. Thanks. It's kind of one of those things. It's like the duck. You know, you see a duck in the water, right? The duck looks like it's cool, but the duck's freaking working hard under the water. Wow. I'm working hard, working hard. That's how our place is. We look cool, but we're working hard.